Hi guys, welcome to Design Technology TV. Today we're going to start a series of videos which are based on the NEA for the OCR exam board. The NEA is the non-examined assessment, also known as the coursework, so this will be the big unit that most students, in fact all students doing the OCR A-level exam board will undertake. Uh, what's important to recognise at the moment is, um, as some of you may well be aware, I'm the lead trainer for OCR. Uh, that means that Hopefully I've got a pretty good understanding of what I'm talking about here. Fundamentally though, this video is not endorsed by OCR themselves, so um, there's no links between this and the exam board directly. This is deliberately a student guide. So although it will touch on marking criteria and looking at assessment objectives because students need to understand those, it won't go into them in full and complete detail because that's not necessary at this stage. The NEA itself, it's an iterative design project. That means that students are working through a project which mimics as closely as possible real life design situations. They need to start off with a project of their choosing, work their way through doing a series of different design options and iterations based on research and feasibility analysis. That will then lead them to then a final design. That final design is then developed uh, through prototype modeling into a final prototype, that prototype is then tested and evaluated. In essence, there's a bit more to it than that. The NEA makes up 50% of the A-level qualification, so the marks associated with it are really important. The students that do very well in the NEA find that then it takes some of the pressure off their exam. Um, and it also means that it gives them access to the highest grades. So the NEA underpins a lot of um, the course in terms of its content. Students who undertake an NEA and put a lot of work into it will cover a lot of the theory aspects that are then going to come up in the exam anyway, uh, which is very useful for them uh, to ensure that they get the highest marks. The assessment itself is broken into five strands and we'll have a look at that at the moment and it's assessed over 24 assessment statements. As students, you will not see all 24 assessment statements in sort of black and white. I won't be asking you to produce work for certain aspects because those aspects will be inherently involved in other parts of the project work. So don't expect to see assignments for every single part. However, you will find that as we work our way through, I'll ask students to go back and review certain aspects to make sure that they're doing things correctly. It's 100 marks total. And it is a substantial amount of work. So at St. Brendan Sixth Form, we look at doing this for about a 10 month project and it will run through to mid-March, um, which is a significant period of time, not only for students to continue to stay focused, but also to manage their workload. It's very easy to for students to go wrong with their management. They slack off, uh, particularly after the summer holidays in sort of October time. They think they've got lots of time remaining to them and then what actually happens is that that compacts and compresses the, all the work that's left, particularly into the start of the following year in January time and makes their life very difficult, very stressful. So first things first, it's a substantial project, stay on top of it, meet my deadlines and the deadlines that I set are minimum deadlines. So if you want to get ahead of those things, there's no problem with that whatsoever. It's your own context. So that means that you've got the opportunity to decide your own project you uh, will be able to do anything that you want within reason. Clearly, complexity is an issue. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But in principle, doing something that's really simplistic that you can design in your head and you know what it's going to look like before the outset of the project is a bit of a no-no because it means it's too easy and too simple. Likewise, we don't want to embark on something where we've got ridiculous amounts of complexity, like a moon lander, or something where we rely on the fact that it could or would do something in real life, something of that sort of nature would be where it's got a significant electronic component, something like a speaker where the internal aspects of the speaker would determine how well the audio sounds. That's very difficult for us to address. Our technology won't be good enough except for just taking the components from another already existing product and placing them within our speaker system. That in itself then doesn't work very well. Fundamentally, this is based around going through the iterative design project and leading to a high quality final prototype 
or prototypes, there may be several. And as I said, there's no restrictions here in terms of how you go about it, either in what project you undertake or the way you approach it. Every project will be unique and slightly different. The 24 strands are here. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all now, but you'll notice it's broken into, sorry, 24 statements broken into five strands. You'll notice we've got explore, design thinking, design communication, final prototype and evaluation. There will be example projects that you can have a look at and you'll be able to have a look at how this is done. You'll notice that the marks associated are broken down on the right hand side. So in terms of explore, we're looking at you investigating feasibility, writing a design brief, engaging a user, those kind of aspects. We then have the design thinking, which is the main body of the design work. So looking at iterating a design or several designs, working your way through to a final solution. Within that, you should be showing high level critical thinking. We then have design communication, so that's the quality of how well you're putting information over. First of all, you'll notice it says chronological progression. That's really important that you guys are doing the work as you do it. So whereas with previous projects, you might have done tons and tons of research at the very start of your project and then not gone back to it. What you'll find here is that you do bits of research at the start to get you going. Then you start designing and then when you highlight that there's an issue or something that you don't know, you do research then. So you do it as it happens. It's a very natural progression. You'll then also want to look at the communication of your initial ideas, so the quality of your sketching and the quality of your modelling, etc, etc. We then have the final prototype. The final prototype itself, there'll be planning, there'll be the final prototype in its physical form. Then a variety of techniques and materials that you use to get yourself there. Then we've got evaluate. So the evaluate is then looking at you using uh, research in the correct way, ensuring that you are using ongoing evaluation as you go. One of the fundamentals to this whole principle is making sure that you are gaining feedback as you go through. Students that find that they struggle getting the higher marks are often ones that don't engage in evaluation from a third party or stakeholders or a user. That then impacts on their ability to pick up on errors, pick up on problems, and also to progress their project meaningfully. Something right from the outset, you should have a user. We'll talk about that in the following video. We'll also have risk assessments. And finally, then feasibility, i.e. testing of your product, and then the evaluation, the final thing. So key influences, and this is something that you need to consider as we go through. First of all is complexity. So if you've got something that is very basic, you are not going to be able to access the higher marks. Quite often what students do will pick a project that has some aspect of modular um, modularity to it. So it means that they can have different component parts. They can then focus on one or two of those component parts, work their way through, improve those bits and make them really good. If within that there's enough complexity and enough work to keep them going through the whole project, they may have component parts that they omit. Equally, then if they get those things done fairly quickly and they go fairly smoothly, they might then add to that. So an example could be a prosthetic leg. So a prosthetic leg will have everything from the foot, the ankle joint, the um, stanchion that holds the weight, and then how maybe the cup and then how it straps the leg. There's a variety of different component parts, each with their own challenges. Because of that, the complexity to do the entire product within the time frame might be too much. So you might only focus on one or two areas. Equally, it might be that you work your way through the entire thing and do a complete product and look at each, each of those bits. We're also looking for creativity. So not just following existing examples or copying existing designs. We want you to come up and work through problems yourself, identify the problems and then resolve them. Depth is really important. As you can see on the right hand side of the screen, detail is king. This is a student's work looking at a leg brace and this is just one component part of it which is the foot brace uh, to make sure that the leg brace was comfortable around the ankle to give you the person the stability they needed to walk. This is just one component part but you can see the student looks at all the different component parts within in it including a hinge, some sprung mechanisms etc etc. So depth is really important and you should be looking at depth down to the washer, the nut, the bolt. In terms of what you're doing, you should stay focused to uh, the 
work you're looking at. It's great if you can bring in influences from other sources, providing they are relevant. But just going down a route and looking at a certain aspect just for the sake of it is pointless. So, for instance, a good example of students becoming unfocused is where they're doing something like a leg breaks project. They know that they're going to have certain materials within it, aluminium, certain plastics, maybe ABS, that kind of stuff, polypropylene. But then they start looking at all plastics or even looking at something random like wood. There's no place for wood within this product. It's irrelevant. It's not focused and that actually will detrimentally affect your focus and then your marks. As I've already mentioned, you will have a stakeholder and a user. So having stakeholders, we talk about specialist stakeholders at St. Brendan's, i.e. people who have specialist knowledge about processes or the product at hand. Maybe that someone knows how to manufacture it. Maybe they know how uh, to sell it. Maybe they're involved in using it on a, in a professional basis. Equally, you might have a user who is in daily contact with the product and to give you feedback on it. Fundamental to the product. Iterative design, user feedback. So we want you to have a user from the outset. So right now you should be thinking, who can you speak to on a regular basis who is a reliable user? If you can't think of someone off the top of your head, then speak to parents or possibly then start sending out emails and in contacting companies to get people involved with the project to help you to overcome aspects and to make more quick progress. Routinely, what students find who engage a user early is that they are capable then of getting information from the user or the specialist stakeholder at the start of the project. That saves them doing all sorts of research that would otherwise be unnecessary and also stops them from making pitfalls or mistakes. Further down the process, you having a user then allows you to get the feedback from that person about your project and they can highlight aspects that you thought were absolutely fine and they'll say, well, that will never work in this context when I use it like this. And that straight away then means that you can then start thinking about it in a more proactive and more positive way and making progress and iterative changes as you need. Finally, project management and organisation is important. As I've already uh, mentioned, timing is important. The other thing to do is managing the problems that you are identifying and then talking about and showing with some clarity how you're resolving and monitoring those issues. OK, so to get started. You need to plan your project. What are you going to do for the project? What we're looking for to start with are three separate ideas. It could be more. Those three separate ideas should all be viable, i.e. they should be suitable to the project. They could just be a single product that has a specific use or they could be resolving a more general problem. So a specific product could be something like the prosthetic leg I was talking about, designed for use in third world countries where there has been some kind of war zone and it might be specifically for children. So it's adjustable for the children as they go. They're cheap because they're 3D printable. And what you're doing there is that product then is a really solid product right from the outset because it's got a reason to be used. It's got the user in mind, etc., etc. Or you might be looking at a problem, which is a more holistic thing. So you might be looking at sustainable living. Uh, you might be looking at compact living because a lot of us live now in smaller spaces, particularly first time buyers. The sustainable uh, living could be looking at materials used within a building, for instance. Uh, it could be compact living and you're looking at a piece of furniture, maybe in a university room or something like that, where you have a piece of multifunctional furniture that resolves issues or problems. Um, so the problem would be compact living and then from that you might end up being creating a piece of furniture it could be something entirely different so often identifying a problem and then the possibilities within it is a very strong approach because it gives you a, a lot more opportunity to look at different things sometimes products can be too specific and that can be an issue if for instance you're doing engineering and you have a product that is based in a single place and it's uh, a bridge for instance that can be completely relevant. It can still be marketable and still be completely appropriate, even though it's quite a focused project at this stage. Uh, the aspects within it are still totally, it's totally possible to either upscale it or move it somewhere else and build it for some particular other place or show that there's still a marketable need for it in that one single location. You'll be able to discuss those aspects with your teacher. So the first thing to do is to think of the three separate ideas that are all viable. They need to be, as I said, at an appropriate level. So your teacher will be able to guide you on this. Quite often students come up with ideas that, although are perfectly viable 
product ideas, they don't meet the A-level specification for either because they're too complex or they're not complex enough. So the ones that are not complex enough means that getting the higher marks will be a real struggle. Um, sometimes they're too complex, so it's just too big an undertaking and it would take years to do and be more of a PhD product project rather than something that's suitable for A-level. Your teacher will be able to guide you through what is an appropriate level with the project. Often making a product modular, making a product multifunctional, having a project that interacts with a user as in it's been held in their hands or they have to touch buttons or press or use component parts of it or wear it, make a really solid uh, appropriate level because it means that because of the fact that it's a product that has to do something in a specific location that then gives it more interesting component parts and adds to the complexity. Once you've picked your three ideas, the first thing to do is then start looking at your feasibility analysis. And there'll be another video on these next three sections in more detail. Feasibility then is looking at how likely and how possible your project is, whether it's got a marketable goal. So while you're looking at these three ideas, start thinking of where the problems are. What is the problem you're actually resolving? What is the proof that the problem actually needs to be resolved? Routinely, students think that there's a project to produce X product. But the problem is, is that in the real life, real world, no one would ever want that product. So there needs to be proof. Now, that proof can come from a variety of sources. And as I said, we'll cover that in more detail in the next video. However, if as you're starting to look into these projects, you find images of existing products that are similar, if you find newspaper articles that show that there is a need for a specific product or you indeed speak to a user about something, uh, feel free to record those things. Keep the URL links because they'll all be very useful as you move forward. Once you've gone through this process of looking at each of these three projects or uh, possible projects, you will then pick one, go into more detail on that and then write a design brief. Within the design brief, as I've already said, you will have a primary user and you must identify the primary user by name. We'll talk more about that in the next video. Fundamentally, from your point of view, if you've got an opportunity now to start engaging with and talking to a primary user, now is the time to start that conversation. Okay, so next video will be on feasibility. Thanks for watching DTTV. Please like and subscribe.